right, buenos dias, mis amigos. All right, real, real quickly, I want to go over this comment here. I appreciate, um, whether you agree or disagree, I appreciate the comments. But uh, let me just say here, in this comment here, when somebody says, uh, you know, um, is right here, just like you cannot understand the word hell means as it is translated into the English language from four different Hebrew and Greek words, that tells me that you don't believe the Bible that you hold in your hands. All right, so you lose your argument right there because you're saying you don't believe the Bible. And when you don't have a foundation to base your opinions from, you're left to your own imagination and I'm not going to argue against your imagination. I'm just going to tell you that the King James Bible is directly from God above. It's not a translation from another man, another language. It comes directly from God. Okay, so let's get into uh, this video today. Uh, I'm just going to critique it. It's going to be a little bit different. But I'm going to critique this video right here. The Pope shared a message about the anti- Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's try this again here. Christ's arrival. The Pope shared a message about the Antichrist's arrival that shocked everyone. For over two centuries, the Catholic Church has grappled with a significant and unsettling question. When will the rapture occur? Will it happen before, during, or after a period of tribulation? So today, we are about to discover the surprising revelation that Pope Francis has made. You might have heard about different ideas regarding the second coming of Jesus and Armageddon, such as pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, and post-tribulation. These ideas have caused disagreements among church leaders. But now, the Vatican, representing a billion Christians worldwide, including <clears throat> even all right, right so the vatican representing a billion christians okay first of all catholics are not christians at all evangelicals and protestants has decided on this matter it's important to pay whoa, attention whoa, whoa, and whoa 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 now the vatican representing a billion christians worldwide including evangelicals and protestants has decided on this matter They've decided on this matter. Oh, who are they? Who are they to decide what the Word of God says? Uh, they, <laughs> look, that's that's crazy. Uh, that's crazy because we don't get the truth from popular opinion. The truth is not subjective. The truth is the truth. It's not, a, it's not comprised of popular opinions at all. It's, it's crazy to even make that assertion. And real quickly. Romans 3 verse 4, God forbid, yeah, let God be true, but every man a liar. It's important to pay attention and understand this decision because those who spread the message of salvation, the gospel, and all things related to the rapture, tribulation, and Armageddon are highly regarded. In fact, the book of Revelation mentions their importance seven times. Did, wait, regardless of wait a second. Did you just hear what this guy said? Is, is this not insanity? He's saying that Catholics, Evangelicals, Protestants have decided on this matter, and it's important because these things are highly regarded. Rapture, Tribulation, and Armageddon are highly regarded. In fact, <laughs> 
It's okay. important to pay attention because these are highly regarded. Not because they're true, but because they're highly regarded. You know, sometimes people talk and, and they have no idea what they're saying. I'm not kidding you. The book of Revelation mentions their importance seven times. Regardless of your belief about the rapture, it's essential to learn how to respond when the time comes. Firstly, who is the Antichrist? In Christian beliefs about the end of the world, there's something called the Antichrist. This Antichrist is someone the Bible says will stand against Jesus Christ and try to take his place before... Right there. And try to take his place. So who today pretends to take the place of Jesus Christ. Who calls themselves the representative of Jesus Christ on earth? Think about it. For Jesus returns for the second coming. The Bible describes the Antichrist as someone who goes against both God the Father and God the Son. There are a few other descriptions linked to the Antichrist as well, like the little horn in Daniel's vision, the man of sin in Paul's second epistle to the Thessalonians, and the beast of the sea in the book of Revelation. These are all part of the Christian belief about the Antichrist. Well, his arrival depends on the period of millennialism. What is millennialism? <sighs> Millennialism is a belief held by some religious groups right. who think that... Bef All right, so before we get into this, let me just note that uh, Pope Francis didn't say anything. <laughs> he breaks his silence and doesn't say nothing. Uh, so this video, I've already seen it once through. Uh, it, it completely ignores um, anything that uh, Pope Francis may have said. And now this is going to dwell into all the different uh, theories of millennialism. And so let's listen. Before the last judgment and the final state of the world, there will be a special time on earth like a golden age or paradise. Both Christian... It's not in the Bible though. Christianity and Judaism have had movements with millennialist ideas. These movements believed that the kingdom of God would come to earth soon. Sometimes these beliefs led to a lot of social unrest. It talks about a series of thousand year periods, each ending in chaos and destruction until a peaceful king finally defeats evil and ends the last thousand year age. Scholars have connected various... Scholars. Scholars. Now, if you read and believe the Bible that you hold in your hands, if you believe it's from God, you have access to everything you could ever ask for. Therefore, you are the scholar. There are not men out there that know more than you, that have access to more than what you have, or that have superior intelligence to you. Not one single man out there does. All you have to do is believe the Bible that you hold in your hands and God will reveal it to you. That's it. And if you don't believe the Bible that you hold in your hands, there's a veil over your heart that is going to prevent you from understanding the Word of God. Yes, social and political movements both religious and non-religious, to these millennialist ideas. A lot of Christian millennial thinking comes from the book of Revelation, especially Revelation chapter 20, verses 2 and 3, which says, He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and locked and sealed it over him so that he would deceive the nations no more. Until the... All right, so if you see me, uh, if you you know, if you're familiar with me, I, I talk about this quite a bit. Satan being bound for a thousand years is 
what is happening right now because the kingdom of God is available to whosoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, before Jesus came, there was one nation of God. Outside of that nation of God were, na were the nations deceived by Satan. And then Jesus comes and he declares that the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. So now the kingdom of God is available all throughout the world and because the kingdom of God is available all throughout the world Satan is bound. He no longer can deceive the nations outside of the nation of God because the kingdom of God is available all throughout the world. I mean, it's pretty simple stuff, really. I don't understand, really, honestly. I don't understand why more people don't teach this and understand this. It's simple because if you know the Bible at all, you know in the Old Testament there was one people of God. Outside of that people of God were the nations deceived. And then Jesus comes and he makes the kingdom of God available to whosoever believes in him. So now Satan is bound during this time period until he returns. And then there will be the separation of the wheat and the tares. All right. Till the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be let out for a little while. Revelation chapter 20, verses... Yeah, again, he'll be let out for a little while. All right, so that's when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and we are lifted up off the earth. And... So all that's left on the earth are the unsaved people. So now, Satan is allowed to deceive the nations, if you will. He is let loose to deceive the nations. And what does he do? He gathers them together at our feet. And fire comes down from God and devours them all. This is a prophecy that goes that's all throughout the Bible that's goes all the way back to Genesis 3 when the Lord said to the serpent I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed it shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel God is going to stomp his foot on the head of the serpent destroying evil forever that's what that means is that we're going to be up in air and God's going to destroy our enemy at our feet. Verses 4 to 6 also tells of judges on thrones and mentions John's vision of souls who stood up for Jesus and refused the mark of the beast. These souls come back to life and rule with Christ for a. No, no that's not what the Bible says at all. Not, not at all. I, that's what the false Bibles teach. So if we go to Revelation 20, and what you'll notice is that, um, you know, uh, a lot of people will suggest, well, there's a second resurrection. There's a first resurrection, and then there's a second resurrection. The problem is... The Bible never ever makes any mention of a second resurrection. It's not anywhere. It's not in Revelation 20. It's not anywhere. Here, I better do this. Uh-oh. Nope. Not there. It's not there. It talks about the first resurrection. On such the second death has no power but makes no mention of a second resurrection if you're gonna teach a doctrine of the second resurrection there ought to be something in the Bible to support it and if you're gonna teach the first resurrection as some sort of pre-resurrection 
of believers and then there's a second resurrection of believers that's a big deal it should be supported by something in the Bible and it's not if you're including yourself in this second resurrection you're condemning yourself because there is no second resurrection it's insanity it really is and uh, what is that verse I gotta think here now a second. John 11, doggone it. In John 11, Jesus plainly says, I am the resurrection. So are you wondering who the, res the first resurrection is? Jesus is the first resurrection. You can't figure that out. It's unbelievable that you can't figure that out. You're going to pretend to be a scholar, an expert on the Bible, and you don't know that Jesus is the resurrection. He is the first resurrection. You can't figure that out. This blessed... Uh, I'm sorry, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. That's Jesus. We that are born of God are partakers. We have part in his resurrection. You can't figure that out. What's the matter with you? You don't believe what the Bible says? You'd rather believe some weird, strange doctrine that's not supported by the Bible at all? Rather than what the Bible very plainly says. Jesus is the resurrection. We are partakers of his resurrection. He has led the way for us. He is our Messiah. He is our leader. He has died, defeated death, rose from the dead into, and ascended into heaven and promised to return for us. And when he returns, we will be lifted up into the air to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, when we're up in the air, that's when God stomps his foot on the head of the serpent, destroying all evil forever. That's when our enemies are gathered at our feet and fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them all. It's the end of the world and all evil is destroyed forever. And of course, a new city of God comes down from heaven onto the earth and there's a new heavens and a new earth. And we're back down in this new world where there is no sin, no more sorrow, no more pain, no more suffering, no more crying, no more death. You can't figure that out. You're still trying to, what, find the second resurrection in the Bible? You're never going to find it, buddy. It's not there. We are partakers of His resurrection. Blessed and holy is He that has part in the first resurrection. On such, the second death has no power. He that believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. On such, the second death has no power. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years, but the rest of the dead lived not again 
until the thousand years are finished. Right? So, at the end of the thousand years, we are resurrected. At the end of the thousand years, not before, lived not again until the thousand years were finished. Not at the beginning, but at the end of the thousand years, we are resurrected. We are partakers of His resurrection during this time period. Right now, we are kings and priests unto God. Right now, we are called to preach the gospel to every creature. Now, hopefully you've heard me preach about this a lot. And so there's really uh, no doubt, hopefully at this point, that we are in this thousand year period and at the end of the thousand years that the rest of the dead will live not again until the thousand years are finished right the, at the end of the thousand years is the end of the world okay all right so i mean this is pretty simple straightforward stuff it's not complicated it what makes it complicated is when you hear all these differing opinions or different differing um, false doctrines really why are you listening to false doctrines why I ask myself this why are you listening to false doctrines and false teachers when the truth is right here in the Word of God those false teachers make it harder, make it hard to understand the simplicity of the Word of God. It really does. Okay. For a thousand years. Oh, there's another thing I got to show you here. He, he says, oh, they, they lived. What do you say? They lived. They resurrected before. And John's vision of souls who stood up for Jesus and refused to mark the beast, these souls come back to life. That's not what it says. These souls come back to life and rule with Christ for a thousand years. That's not what it says at all. Unless. See, and the rest of the dead live not again. Let's see, where. Oh, is that where it was? Okay. Now let's see. Let's see if you're right there, buddy. We're gonna see what these said. Uh no, no. I think you meant four, didn't you? <laughs> All right, so. Um, let's see. Somewhere, I gotta, I gotta find it. I gotta find it. Maybe it was six. All right, no, right there it is. And they came to life. Right there it is. Verse four. And they came to life. Let's see, how many times do we see this? An ERV? Is it in the ESV too? And right there it is. In the ESV. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. That's not what it says. This is changing doctrine. And promoting doctrines of devils. It's incredible. And people lightly view the topic of um, the different Bible translations or versions or whatever you want to call them. The, there's a whole bunch of corrupt Bibles. And so it's amazing to me when people are able to recognize some 
Bibles as being corrupt and not the others. It's incredible. It really is. Because you're what you're really doing is you're selecting which Bible's true and which one's not. And there's only one true Bible in the English language. It is the King James Bible. It comes directly from God. You cannot trust the ESV. I could show you that there's all kinds of omissions and errors. And that too, yeah. You got it, buddy. Yeah, I don't like it either. And so here, when this says they, they came to life, that's not true. That's not what the scripture says at all. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. We that are born of God live and reign with Christ right now. And at the end of the thousand years, it's the end of the world. And we will, at that time, be resurrected. At that time. At that time. And this is supported all throughout the Bible. It really is. Let's go here first. Yeah, that's, I like it too. This is a good verse too. I think so. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord yeah that's right at the end of the world you got it buddy you got it this happens at the end of the world which is at the end of the thousand years of Revelation 20 and when we are lifted up in the air right when the thousand years are expired we're lifted up in the air and now all that is left on the earth are unbelievers are the unsaved people and so therefore satan is loosed to go out and deceive the nations like he had done before outside of the people of god in the old testament wow and they are gathered together at our feet and God stomps his foot on the head of the serpent, destroying evil forever. Notice here, compass the camp of the saints about. That's when we're up in the air. Where is the city of God? Well, the city of God is above. Jerusalem, which, which is above. The beloved city, the beloved city, compass the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, Jerusalem, above, we're up in the air, just as it says in 1 Thessalonians 4, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout of the voice of the archangel and the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air right it's incredible it's incredible how simple this is really it's incredible and it's gonna play out just like what the Bible says and these men yeah they do, don't they? They pose themselves as experts, having knowledge, understanding, yet they don't know nothing. They don't have any understanding at all. It's incredible. But you know what's even more amazing? Is that the Bible says 
Yeah, it does, doesn't it? It's, it says exactly what is happening today. Evil men. Oh, go ahead, say it. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And what do we see today? Evil men and seducers waxing worse and worse deceiving and being deceived it's incredible it's amazing everything is playing out exactly as the bible says of the beast these souls come back to life and rule with christ for a thousand years this is called the first resurrection those who take part in it are considered this is called the first resurrection so to heck with jesus hey, forget about what, what he says Jesus says he's the resurrection, but Bozo the Clown, or whoever this guy is here, he says, we're the first resurrection. Who? You and your... Your phony... I better watch my language. They're blessed and holy. They serve as priests of God and Christ and rule with them for a thousand years. Reformation and beyond. What? Are you not a priest of God right now? I mean, by your definition, you're not a priest of God. Yeah, he's wrong, isn't he? Well, he's act well, actually, he might be right. He's not a priest of God. But we that are born of God, we are kings and priests of God right now. Beyond. A key part of millennialist thinking revolves around passages in the book of Revelation. These passages suggest that Satan will be locked away for 1,000 years when Christ returns to judge everyone. After that, he'll be set free to start a final battle against God and his saints. In the past, Catholic and Orthodox theologians didn't have a clear, agreed-upon view of what this meant. They mainly... <laughs> well, what would it matter if they agreed or not? It doesn't dictate the truth. What are you, insane? I... Here again, we have somebody implying that men dictate the truth, and they don't. Mainly focused on the idea that the world's end would come suddenly, like a thief in the night, and the idea of the... Oh, didn't I just do... Didn't I just do a video on the thief? Thief. How do you spell thief? In First Peter or Second Peter, isn't it? Second Peter, three, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned. Oh, it does. Does it? Okay. Let's see. Is that true? That's right. The fire come down from God out of heaven and devoured. Them. You see the parallel here? When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, the earth is going to be destroyed by fire. As it was in the days of Noah, when God destroyed the world by water, this time he destroys it by fire. Therefore, there is no thousand year period coming after the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, your whole dummy doctrine of whatever you're imagining a thousand bonus years to me that's what it sounds like you're preaching a thousand bonus years that'll never happen the antichrist millennialist theories aim to explain what this 1000 years of yeah, satan bound that. in chains might look like there are different types of millennialism in Christian eschatology. This is especially true in Protestantism, where you have premillennialism, postmillennialism, and amillennialism. These views differ in how they see the millennial kingdom relating to Christ's second coming. Three schools of thought. First is premillennialism. In Christian eschatology, we come across different beliefs, such as premillennialism, postmillennialism, and amillennialism, regarding Christ's return and the thousand-year reign. 
Premillennialism suggests that Christ's second coming will happen before the millennium, with Christ's reign on earth during this time. Fundamentalist Christians, especially evangelicals, often embrace this view. Both postmillennialists and premillennialists what? share what? the idea of a thousand. Oh, wait a second. You're what? Like some sort of god that you're. You're just making that sort of. Wow. Fundamentalist Christians, especially evangelicals, you know the minds of all these people and what they view. It's incredible. You must be God Almighty. Uh, you know what? I can't take this crap anymore. If you watch the whole thing, uh, you know, if you watch the whole thing, <clears throat> wow, you're, you're dumb like me. That's all I can say. All right. So the one thing. Here, let's, let's listen to this part here. Christ's second coming from Judgment Day. The Catholic Church doesn't use the term rapture, but it does anticipate a gap. Uh, oh, boy, the Catholic Church must be special. Uh, crap. The uh, Catholic Church aligns with amillennialism, where there's no distinct millennial periods, surprisingly near, nearly... Two-thirds of Christians are amillennialists. Now, how, how, I'd, why, if two-thirds of Christians were amillennials, then how's come almost nobody is preaching amillennialism? I mean, two-thirds. I see. Amillennials? Nope. Amillennials? Nope. Amillennials? Nope. Oh, amillennials? Nope. Amelie, nope, 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 nobody. That's crazy. Months and months and months and months and months. For years now. I've been going. This is a metabolism killer. This. Good grief almighty. Oops. Okay. So I've been doing this for a long time. Yeah, maybe one out of a hundred, if that. Two thirds. You're just making, you're you're making so you're lying is what you're doing. When you say two thirds of Christians are a millennials, that's not true. That's not true at all. I mean, that's not even close to being true. That's just a flat out lie. Hey, you're talking about all these different false doctrines with. But you can't focus on the truth? Well, maybe that's because you don't know what the truth is. And then here again, for instance... For instance, 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 8 mentions that, With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. Yeah, that has no relevance to biblical prophecy at all. None whatsoever. The context of that verse in, in 2 Peter 3 8 is not in the context of biblical prophecy at all. It merely states that God can see the beginning from the end, the end from the beginning. He can see, yeah, He can see. A moment in time as though it was a long period of time. He can see a long period of time as though it was a moment in time. God can see it all. It has nothing at all to do with biblical prophecy whatsoever. All right, and, and <clears throat> excuse me. In the context of that is also that um, God is not slack concerning His promise that He will return, as some men count slackness. All right. It, he's not slack at all. So that's the context, and this is just a flat-out lie. When you're implying mm, a thousand years like a day, so maybe the thousand-year reign of Christ is really a day, where Jesus reigns for a day. 
and then it, he stops raining. And then, of course, it's your turn to take over, right? I mean, what are you saying? What are you teaching, man? Really, what are you implying? A thousand years is like a day. So Jesus reigns for, he doesn't reign for a thousand years, he reigns for a day. Well, of course, I'm going to tell you that he, Jesus doesn't reign for a thousand years. He reigns forever. It, it even talks about that in the book of Revelation, that Jesus reigns forever. And then, of course, in Luke chapter 1, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. That's right, you got it. Where am I? Let's go to Revelation. Oh, let's find one here. Let's go to. Uh, he shall bring us. He has made us. This is in Revelation 1 also. We are kings and priests. Alright. And he shall reign forever. Right there in Revelation 11. He shall reign forever. Then all of a sudden. God changed his mind in Revelation 20 and said he's going to reign for a thousand years. No. Have you not even read Revelation 20? It doesn't say Jesus reigns for a thousand years. It says we reign, we live and reign with Christ during this thousand years. And it makes no mention of Jesus reigning a thousand years at all. Yeah. I'm glad you agree, buddy. I'm glad you agree. At least somebody does. Alright, so, blah, 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 yeah, you said it best, buddy, you said it better than I do, alright, and then blah, 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 I think, I think I, I, I've taken as much as I can take from this guy right here, I ain't gonna pop Premillennialism, amillennialism, postmillennialism, blah 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 blah. They'll tell you anything and everything but the truth because they don't know it. I'm not kidding you. Why, why even horse around with all these different theories if you know what the truth is? Maybe I should ask myself that, huh? The point that I want to make, though, hopefully you know it is I want to show you the spirit of error and show you the spirit of truth. These three schools of thoughts and the Antichrist arrival comment below and subscribe arrive for more. You know, it's interesting. He made no mention at all of what Pope Francis said. What what the Antichrist say? what the Antichrist say? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's go to where we at here. Exodus 25. Let's start at verse 17. And thou shalt make a mercy seat of pure gold, two cubits and a half shall be the length thereof, and a cubit and a half, and breadth of thereof. And thou shalt make two cherubims of gold, of beaten work shalt thou make them in the two ends of the mercy seat. And shall make one cherub of the one end, and the other cherub of, of on the other end. Even of the mercy seat shall you make the cherubims on the two ends thereof. So you want to you want to take a look at what this looks like. There we go. There we go. Oh, got a little teeny picture. Can we get a bigger picture? Is that it? Right there. So you, so you think this guy is God? You think he represents Jesus Christ? You think he's taken the place of Jesus Christ on earth? Isn't that the definition of the Antichrist? In place of? Sits between the two cherubims? Who opposes what is that verse who exalts himself who opposes 
What is that verse? How does that go? Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Or that that's not him. Or there's somebody else that sits between two cherubims, posing himself as though he is the representative of Jesus Christ on earth. There's somebody else other than the Pope that's more popular than the Pope, really? Well, let's talk about that, huh? Leave a comment there. You mortal souls, tell me who you think the Antichrist is today. Right? In X. Oh, wait a second. That's not where I want to go. I want to go to Isaiah. I just read that in Exodus 25. Let's go to Isaiah 37. Oh, Lord of hosts, God of Israel that dwells between the cherubims. Is this the Lord God of Israel who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God uh, so that he So that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The Pope thinks he's the Holy Father. And Jesus, of course, says, Call no man father on earth, for you, you have one father which is in heaven. The word Pope means father. I make no mistake about that. John 17, verse 11, And now I am no more in the world, this is Jesus speaking, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, he's not talking to the Pope, I guarantee it. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. This is not God at all. This is the anti Christ and the, they claim to have over 1 billion followers and they probably do I don't doubt that at all I don't doubt that at all I don't doubt it at all don't dispute it not, 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 so, what, none so, not so whatsoever I don't dispute it they got over 1 billion good for them good Good for them. You know, and that, you really, I think that's consistent with Revelation 17 in John's vision. And I saw the woman speaking of the Roman Catholic Church drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus and when I saw her I wondered with great admiration this is no small organization this is a big deal and how could you not look at the Roman Catholic Church church today 
and wonder with great admiration for what they've done. It's incredible. It really is. But they are exactly what the Bible is warning us against. Now consider this in Luke 18. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? Now think about this while you're considering that the Roman Catholic Church has over one billion followers. If, if you believe that, that um, all those people that are followers of the Roman Catholic Church, if you believe they're all saved, then you can forget about Jesus coming anytime soon. It's, I mean, we're not even close to the end. Uh, we're at least a billion years away from the end of the world. And we're not even remotely close. And let me show you another verse here. Let's go to Luke. Or no, well... I already hit that. Well, we can still go back there, I think. Let's let's just go to Matthew 24. Let's go to Matthew 24 and consider verse 22. All right, let's consider verse 22. Let's consider this verse here can't even get it to do that. Okay. Verse 22, And except those days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Did you hear that? Except those days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. So, if there are a billion people saved today because they are followers of the Roman Catholic Church we're nowhere near this point in time where there's very few people saved we're nowhere near it if God what this verse here means if is if God let things play out there would come a point to where there would be nobody saved. Remember that verse in Luke 18. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Question mark. Except those days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. If God let things play out the way they are, there would be nobody saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. How many people were saved in the days of Noah? Eight. There are billions of people alive in the days of Noah, yet only eight were saved. There were million people, millions of people living in Sodom, in the cities round about. And of the people of Sodom, there was not even ten righteous. Not even ten. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. As it was in the days of Noah, so also shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man, when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven. 
there are not one billion people saved in the world today. There isn't. Consider this chapter, Genesis 18. The conversation that is being taken place here between Abraham and God. When Abraham's trying to negotiate with God. So what if there's 50 righteous within the city? We not spare those 50 that are righteous. And God said, okay, all right. If there's 50 righteous, I'll spare them. And then, of course, the more Abraham pondered this, considered it, thought about it, meditated on it, he said, well, <clears throat> huh. Thing is, man, I'm not even sure there's 50 righteous. Well, let's let's knock this down to 40. Because right? I, I just, I'm not confident that there are 50. I've, I've been there. I've seen it firsthand. And this place is filthy. Rotten to the core. So, what, what, so let's negotiate. Let's go down to 40. And then God says, okay, all right, if there's 40, I'll spare it. And Abraham, he's scratching his head thinking, man, I don't know, 40, gee whiz, man. Oh, God, you know, the more I think about this, there's not even 40. So let's knock this down to 30. Then let's knock this down to 20. And then finally, let's knock it down to 10. And you, do you know the rest of the story? Yeah. Yeah. You do, don't you? Because God destroyed Sodom. There was not even ten righteous in that city and God destroyed it and in the days before the flood or in the days of Noah there was only eight souls that were saved and will not God avenge his own elect which cry out day and night though he bear long with them I tell you, God will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Question mark. I mean, that's, uh, you know, it's a heck of a question to ask. Will anybody have faith when Jesus comes? Are there anybody today that has faith in Jesus? Uh, surely I'm not the only one, right? Uh, I don't believe there are very, ma very many. I really don't. I don't believe there are very many people at all. And one of the evidences I give is, why is it that the Bible seems so hard to understand? And you know, I'm guilty of it too. Listening to false teachers. I want to learn. I want to know. But at the end of the day, the Word of God has to take precedence over what any man says. Are you teaching this idea that people can lose their salvation? Are you teaching this idea that you can save yourself? Are you teaching this idea that there are some people... Who are saved simply because they were born born of the flesh are you teaching things contrary to God it's pretty obvious to me a whole bunch of people are a whole bunch of people they don't know that they wouldn't know the truth if it smacked them in the beak 
because they don't want to believe it. They don't want to believe the simple scripture. That's the world that we're in today. This stuff is simple. Well, why is it everybody's getting it wrong? Is it because they don't have faith? Is that why there are so many false teachings? Is it part of the growing process? Or is it a sign of the lack of faith? Really? Because if you have faith, God opens your eyes. And you can see. And if you don't have faith, there's a veil over your eyes and you cannot see. Even to this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. We have many prophecies, many teachings all throughout the Bible. about this particular verse. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted, and I should heal them. Right? This goes all the way back. I mean, this is all throughout the Bible, really. Exampled all throughout the Bible. Let's see if we can find something. Here we go. In Isaiah 6, make the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes lest they, should, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with heart and convert and be healed. It's all throughout the Bible. You think about the serpent in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3. Yea, has God said, getting Eve to doubt the Word of God. And so what happens when you don't believe the Bible that you hold in your hands? There's a veil that is over your heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Right? And when the veil is taken away, that's when you're converted, and that is when you begin to be, that's when you are healed, right? And that's when you begin to see with your eyes and hear with your ears. And the truth will be made known to you. So why are so many people blind today? Well, it's because they don't have faith. 